This is our lecture on the role of sex, gender, and sexuality in American history, and this might be your first real introduction to such a topic. However, in this history class, we are going to have several lectures on women's history and the role of men and women in various eras, as well as on the history of sexuality, and we'll particularly look at how culture has changed between the colonial era and the Victorian era. And although this might be your first time, you know, really learning some of this information, it is really important. And it's important in the context of attempting to understand the undercurrents of culture and how they're affected by politics and social changes and economic changes. And if you think of it as if you were today trying to explain to an outsider what American culture is like, it would be nearly impossible to explain this without looking at and discussing sexuality in America or without discussing gender in America because were someone to turn on the television or were they to look at our advertisements or look at our education system or look at the way people interact with one another, they would necessarily have questions about the sexual norms within our culture. And also when you look at many of the current events going on today, they have these undercurrents of issues that revolve around gender and sexuality. And that's not something that's new. That's been around for you know, thousands of years and hundreds of years in the United States. And in order for you to really get the most out of these various lectures and discussions, there are a couple of terms that you need to, to understand and to understand why they're so important. So in this lecture, I'm going to start by defining things like sex and gender and sexuality, and also talking about the sex, gender, and sexuality binary. Um, and we're going to spend some time trying to understand what academics think about the sex and gender binary. And I'm sure that at some point in this lecture, for most of you, there will be something that challenges your beliefs. Uh, certainly, I don't expect you to automatically uh, wholesale subscribe to all of the ideas that I'm presenting to you, but I do expect you to understand what the ideas are and to know that this, these are the beliefs that are held most commonly by those in the academic community. And as long as you can explain the elements or the content of each one of these definitions uh, in the way that it's been taught to you, then you will be on the right track in the class. So I want to start out by understanding a couple of key definitions, and the first term is sex. So I have a question here, what is sex? And I'm actually not asking about sexual intercourse or the physical act of engaging in sex. So throughout this lecture in PowerPoint, I'm going to ask questions about definitions, and feel free to go ahead and pause the lecture and to write down or think about the way that you've been taught about each of these definitions, and to see if your particular definition matches up with the one that I give you. Okay, so sex refers to the biological and physiological characteristics that define men and women. And that would mean, in other words, that male and female are sex categories. And if you look at various human societies, both today and throughout history, aspects of sex are not going to vary substantially between different societies. Some examples of sex characteristics would be that women menstruate and men don't, uh, that men have testicles and women do not, that women have developed breasts and are usually capable of lactating, and men typically do not, and that men generally have more massive bones than women do, as there is a form of sexual dimorphism in humans where men are typically about 25% larger than most women. The next term for us to consider is gender. What have you been taught or what have you gleaned over the years is the definition of gender. Gender actually refers to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for men and women. Notice I say that the society considers appropriate for men and women. So that might mean that it's not something that you're innately born with. Therefore, if you look at gender categories, they're masculine and feminine, whereas if you remember, sex categories are male and female. 
And if you look at different societies, as well as at societies in different time periods, unlike sex, aspects of gender can vary very much between various societies. So if you look at the illustration here, it says you can think about the coat rack as sex. It's your physical structure. And then if you look at what is adorning that coat rack, what you hang on it, that's your gender. So if you have a pink feather boa, you might be feminine. Uh, whereas if you have a letterman's athletic jacket, you might identify as masculine. In some ways, this might already give you a hint that some would argue that gender is something that you perform, that you can actively choose what you're going to hang on your coat rack. And it brings up the question of how many genders there are and how many sexes there are, because you might not necessarily have the same gender as sex. Some examples of gender characteristics might be that in the United States and in most other countries, women earn less money than men do for similar work. It's called the wage gap. In Vietnam, many more men than women smoke, as female smoking has not traditionally been considered appropriate. And in fact, female smoking wasn't considered appropriate in the United States until after the 1920s, prostitutes were the ones who were most likely to smoke until the flappers changed this. Uh, in addition, in Saudi Arabia, men are allowed to drive cars and women can't. And in most of the world, women do more housework than men. You may also have heard the term gender roles. Uh, gender roles are a culture's expectations for masculine or feminine behavior, including attitudes, actions, and personality traits that are associated with being male or female in that particular culture. So f with gender roles, it is basically saying the way that a man is supposed to behave in a masculine way and the way that a woman is supposed to behave in a feminine way is laid out by these gender roles. Now remember that in different cultures and different societies and in different time periods, what it means to be masculine and what it means to be feminine might be entirely different than what we know living in the United States today. And then the last term here is gender identity, and this is an individual sense of being male or female. And it again raises that question of what if a person is born biologically of the sex female, but they identify with a gender identity of masculine? Or what if they're born biologically male and identify with the identity of feminine? Generally speaking, sociologists believe that there are two ways in which people acquire gender roles. There's the social learning theory and the gender schema theory. Now, according to the social learning theory, gender identity is formed through the reinforcement of appropriate gender behavior, as well as imitation of gender models. And so an example of this might be if you see a child fall down and skin their knee, if it's a little boy, Oftentimes the parents will pick him back up and dust him off and tell him to stop crying and be a man. And he's supposed to ascribe to those gender characteristics of being manly and tough and stoic. But on the other hand, if you see a little girl fall down, the parents will often cuddle with her, give her a band-aid or kiss her boo-boos. And it's almost as though they're giving her permission to be emotional and to feel pain, whereas they don't allow the same for boys, which may also show you the way in which gender roles are limiting not just for women but also for men. Now the second theory, the gender schema theory, is a theory of gender identity acquisition in which a child develops a mental pattern or a schema for being male or female and then organizes observed and learned behavior around that schema. And this sounds really complicated, but all it means is that children learn about what it means to be male and female or masculine and feminine really from the culture in which they live and so according to this theory children adjust their behavior to fit with the gender norms and the expectations of their culture and it suggests that children gradually form their gender identity as they learn about the network of themes and associations within their own culture.
In addition, this kind of gender schema is closely linked to self-concept. So children engage in gender appropriate behavior and it's motivated by a desire to be a good boy or a good girl. And an example of this might be that oftentimes you see what seem like little boy toys versus little girl toys. And little boys know that they should be playing with fire trucks and dump trucks and Legos, whereas little girls are often told that they should be playing with baby dolls and they should be playing tea party and they'll be um, playing games that nurture uh, the spirit of what it is to be feminine. Or on the other hand, you might see over time a little girl sitting and watching her mother um, you know, cook and set the table every day and she may begin to associate uh, being feminine with being someone who takes care of the family through cooking and serving, whereas a little boy might see the father being the disciplinarian when he gets home, or he might see him being the one who's asked to do odd jobs around the house that require knowledge of electricity or of power tools, and so he might begin to associate the concept of masculinity um, with the ability to perform these tasks. If you're interested in understanding a little bit more about how children acquire gender that impacts them throughout their life, you really can make a fascinating study of the difference between toys made for girls and those made for boys in our society. I recently went shopping a couple of weeks ago to find uh, some toys for a little girl, and I found myself stopping every couple of feet and taking pictures and uploading them to Facebook of the little girl toys because I was so astounded by how different they were from the boy toys. Uh, so as I walked down the aisles of the girl toys I saw these strange dolls that had gigantic heads that didn't do anything and I saw uh, a bunch of baby dolls and their claim to fame was that they pooped uh, one pooped charm bracelets or something of the sort um, and there was just pink it was like you know an explosion of pink had vomited all over the aisle and then as I made my way over to the boy section I saw these really neat Lego sets and transformers and all these cool scientific experiments that you just didn't see over in the girl section and so there's a link on this page um, to a YouTube video called Toy Ads and Learning Gender and it's a really good analysis of the way in which toys and the advertisements for toys target either boys or girls and teach them what it means to be masculine and what it means to be feminine and as you look at these you see that the boy toys are generally toys in which boys are meant to compete to build, to produce, and also it often encourages them to be aggressive. And if you look at the girl toys, you find that they're helping them to be more nurturing. Um, oftentimes they are helping them in the pursuit of the beauty standard. There's a lot of uh, beauty items and hair brushing that goes on and, and jewelry. Um, or you see in the girl toys that they're playing and having fun just for the sake of having fun. So when you look at the boy toys, they're actively making and constructing. And so these are training blocks for a creative and fulfilling adult life, whereas the girl toys are really missing that element. Okay, so now that you understand the difference between sex and gender, let's talk about what scholars call binarism or the binary. And this is a gender system that has really a social boundary that discourages people from crossing or mixing gender roles or from identifying with forms of gender expression other than the one set masculine and feminine uh, roles. And so a sex binary is a classification of sex in two distinct opposite and disconnected forms, and that would be you're either male or you're female. A gender binary would be a classification of gender into two distinct opposite and disconnected forms where you're either masculine or feminine. And what scholars have discovered is that these are not biologically proven and they're also not innate. 
They're not something that people are necessarily born to. And I'm sure you're specifically asking, well, how can one be neither male nor female? How can there be anything other than a sex binary? But I promise I'm going to answer that a little bit later. Um, it's important to remember, though, that various cultures in various time periods see sex and gender in different ways. And you'll see this throughout American history, especially in the colonial era. And so that means that sex and gender, if they mean different things to different people, are not innate or immutable. And I'm going to spend the rest of the PowerPoint really attempting to display um, and explain this to you. Every time I discuss the gender binary in my classes, I do a little experiment with my students and every single time we do it, we get basically the same results. And so what I'll ask them is to come up with a list of all the traits of someone who is stereotypically feminine and then come up with a list of all the traits of someone who is stereotypically masculine. And I'll say, you know, what is it that society and the media tells you you need to do to be a manly man versus a womanly woman? What do you need to act like? What do you need to look like? And even what kind of jobs might you have um, if you're feminine versus if you're masculine? And so they come up with, for feminine, you're typically passive, you're dependent, you're easily influenced and submissive, you're home oriented, you're more nurturing, you're easily hurt emotionally, and oftentimes they say women are irrational, um, indecisive, talkative, they're more gentle and sensitive, um, they are much more desirous of security than men are, they cry a lot, they're verbal and kind, um, and then if you compare that to what you find in the masculine side for characteristics, you'll find that they're aggressive, they're independent, they're breadwinners, they're not easily influenced, they're dominant and active, they're worldly, they're not easily hurt emotionally, they're decisive, they're not at all talkative, they're tough and stoic, they're less sensitive to others' feelings, they're not as desirous of security, they can take care of themselves, they rarely cry, they're logical, they're analytical, they're cruel in some cases and blunt, and they're not as nurturing. Um, and then if you look at this other chart on the right side, you see that uh, with male versus female and masculinity versus femininity, men are perceived as being active, women as passive. Men are strong, women are weak. Men are workers, women are mothers. Men are natural, they don't have to go through that process of getting ready every morning by doing their hair and their makeup and their clothes and spending two hours whereas women are represented by cosmetics. Men are intelligent and women are supposedly intellectually inferior and masculine men are independent and feminine women are dependent. And you'll notice a couple of things here. The first is that most of the masculine traits are overwhelmingly positive and most of the feminine traits are overwhelmingly negative. Oftentimes when I ask what kind of jobs are masculine and what kind are feminine, people will tell me a masculine job is a CEO, a police officer, um, someone in the business world, a high-powered executive, and so they will almost always throw out careers that are uh, certainly making more money, but also they're viewed in a positive light. And then for a feminine career path, they'll say a stay-at-home mother, a nurse, any kind of pink collar job that requires nurturing elements. But what I really want you to see through this is that there really is no such thing as feminine or masculine because the next thing that I do is to ask my students okay of all of the men in this classroom how many of you would consider yourselves to be nurturing and oftentimes they don't necessarily raise their hands at first and then I say how many of you are going to be good fathers and suddenly they realize wait I might be nurturing and how many of you can be submissive how many of you don't always want a dominant role in a relationship? And how many of you are sometimes talkative? Uh, how many of you are gentle or kind? How many of you are emotional sometimes? Do you cry ever? And 
Inevitably, for each one of these questions, there are going to be men raising their hand to admit to these particular traits. And then for the women, I ask, how many of you are independent or aggressive? How many of you consider yourselves to be cosmopolitan or you know, not easily hurt emotionally and tough? How many of you can be kind of blunt or you know, not necessarily desiring security? And inevitably, there will be many women that raise their hand for these masculine traits. And so it might surprise you that up on the board we'll have this sort of 1950s regurgitated gender roles, but when you actually ask people who they are at their core, no one fits into specifically feminine or specifically masculine. Every day when you watch television and when you walk around and look at billboard advertisements and you just hear people's conversations, you'll see that there are all kinds of gender stereotypes swirling around us and those stereotypes are really limiting for men as well as for women. And you'll see that throughout the course of history in this class that those stereotypes have changed over time. And I'm just going to give you one of the masculine stereotypes and one of the feminine stereotypes that are our current right now so that you can understand what I'm talking about. Uh, you might have noticed, for example, with the masculine stereotypes that oftentimes when you watch commercials, they will have this sort of dumb dad uh, advertisement uh, strategy. And so there was a big controversy about a year ago about some of the Huggies ads. And in these diaper ads, they basically implied that men are inattentive parents and that they can barely change a diaper. And so this particular ad would show a group of these dudes sitting around watching sports and they couldn't tear their eyes off of the game long enough to tend to their infants who had soiled their diapers. And there was this accompanying page on Facebook uh, that was a promo page for Huggies that called dads the ultimate test for diapers and it urged its readers to find a dad and to hand him some diapers and wipes and to watch the fun. Um, and one picture actually showed a guy in a tie, presumably just getting home from the office, looking less than pleased to be holding a baby in a diaper bag. Um, and in other commercials, you'll often find these men as being portrayed as dumb and insensitive to their wives and, and to their children. And the link down at the bottom of the page actually links you to 10 examples of these you know, stereotypical dumb men advertisements that are quite harmful because they are teaching a younger generation that men can't be good fathers, that men aren't supposed to be good fathers because of the stereotypes that exist. And then if you want to look at the gender stereotypes of what it means to be feminine or a woman, really you see very pervasive negative stereotypes throughout society and the media, but you just have to turn to all things Disney to see these stereotypes. So if you start out with the Disney princesses, with Snow White you find a character in which her burgeoning sexuality is a threat to another woman, so she's killed by this woman and her only asset is her physical beauty, and this is what saves her in the end, but she doesn't save herself. A man comes along and saves her. And then Sleeping Beauty or Princess Aurora, you find that she's betrothed at birth um, to solidify her political position. She's killed by another woman out of spite, just like Snow White, and her owner or her um, fiance goes in and saves her with a kiss, and again, sex and her beauty is her only salvation. Um, Princess Jasmine must get married to satisfy the requirements of her legal system. Her reluctance to do so causes her very powerful father no end of trouble, and she is enslaved by a powerful man and is only saved by the wit of a street rat. Um, Princess Ariel, um, this one drastically changes her physical appearance. She's willing to give up her voice and she's willing to experience sharp pains when she does walk so that she can be more attractive to a man. Um, and the price is that she can't speak, but that's not a problem. She doesn't have anything of value to say anyways. And she's saved by a prince simply for being beautiful. Uh, the stereotypical image of Belle from Beauty and the Beast, she saves a prince's life with her only asset, which again, is her beauty.
And then lastly, Cinderella is saved from terrible living conditions by a prince, and he does this not because she's such a hard worker or such a wonderful person, but because she's beautiful, and he only knew her for a couple of hours, so all he really had to go on was her beauty. And these are images that little girls in American society are inundated with. It's how they learn to become women. It's what they learn about what it means to be feminine. And all of the emphasis is put on how attractive a girl is and on the fact that she can be saved by a man if she's attractive enough. And in fact, you may have gotten sick of the um, kind of hubbub that's surrounding Disney's mo new movie Frozen, but one of the reasons why it's so particularly um, popular and embraced by lots of people is that for the first time it shows a Disney princess figure actually saving herself and focusing on saving her sister rather than a man that she's fallen in love with. Okay, so I started with the easier of the two binaries, uh, the gender binary, and debunking that one. But let's go ahead and look at the sex binary, the idea that there are only two opposite forms of sex, which are male and female. And if I ask you the question of how many sexes there are, you might say, well, do you mean in animals or humans? Because, you know, biologists know that there are certain types of birds in which they've found very clearly that there are five different sexes. And yet, many people believe that with humans, there can only be two different types of sexes. Um, and yet, according to the Intersex Society of North America, one in 1,500, or one in every 2,000 children is born with ambiguous genitalia. And these would be people who used to be known as hermaphrodites, but today we call them intersexed. Um, there's a lot more people than this who are born with a subtler form of sex anatomy variation, and some of these don't show up until later in life. And so, for example, you could have someone reach the age of 13, go into the hospital as a female for an ultrasound, and find out that she actually has testes inside of her, as well as the traditional female anatomy. Or you could have a male who was, you know, someone born male, identified as a, a boy, who over time, when he went through puberty, began to develop breasts that uh, emerged in the same way that a female's breast would. And so where do these people fit into the picture? The question becomes, are there only two sexes? And if there could be more than two sexes, can there be more than two genders? And so many scholars would argue that there are an infinite number of genders and that there are an infinite number of sexes, that very few people lay on opposite ends of the spectrum and that most people actually fall somewhere along this spectrum um, all the way from the ends to the middle. So now would be a good time to go ahead and pause the lecture and to read the article that I provided for you entitled Intersex Children, Boy, Girl, Who Decides? Um, this is an ABC News story and it does a really good job of explaining exactly what intersex is and of looking at the contemporary issues that revolve around deciding how that child should live, whether they should identify as male or female, who should make that decision for them, and what kind of issues will arise throughout their lives. And it's, it's a good way of understanding what's happening in the contemporary era so that I can then compare it to what may have happened in the past. Okay, so we're getting to the part of the lecture where you should have a pretty strong understanding of the various definitions of sex and gender and sex binary uh, and gender binary and the continuum of sex and gender. And so I'd like to link this back to American history now by discussing what historians call the strange case of Thomasine Hall. There are some primary source records on this that I'll provide for you on Blackboard in case you'd like to read some of the original documents. In telling the story of the strange case of Thomasine Hall, it can be difficult to figure out which gender pronouns to refer to Thomasine with because alternately uh, Thomasine would live as a woman or 
live as a man by the name of Thomas, uh, but Thomasine was actually born a girl living in England, and so I'm going to use she as the identifier here. Um, Thomasine ends up moving at the age of 12 to Plymouth, England, and it's at this age that she begins to dabble with dressing sometimes as a man and at other times as a woman. Thomasine then assumes the identity of a man when she moves to the United States to work as an indentured servant. And when she arrives, she'll sometimes dress as a woman, and then she'll sometimes continue dressing as this man, and it really arouses the suspicion and the curiosity of her neighbors who were trying to understand, is Thomasine a man? Is Thomasine a woman? Uh, where does she fit into the structure and the order of a society in which gender roles are very specifically laid out? By the year 1629, Thomasine Hall is actually living and working as a female servant on the plantation of John Tyros, and this is located right around the Jamestown area, and a rumor began going around the plantation that Thomasine had had relations with a serving maid named Great Bess, who was also a female. And this kind of fornication between two women was considered against the law, but more than this, because Thomasine sometimes went as Thomas, as a male, uh, people in the community began to think that this really needed to be checked out. And at one point, two local men, without Thomasine's permission, grabbed her and decided to examine her and find out exactly whether she was male or female. And they began telling others that she was actually a he. Now the plantation owner wasn't necessarily convinced by this, and he had three women in good standing in the society, Alice Long, Dorothy Rhodes, and Barbara Hall, come in one night and once again without the permission of Thomasine Hall, they stripped her down and decided to determine whether or not she was a male or female. And according to their opinion, Thomasine once again was seen as a male. Now this might have been the end of the story, except that Thomasine was hauled in front of the Virginia court on fornication charges, and once she was brought in front of the court, in order to determine what kind of charge should stick, they had to determine if Thomasine was in fact male or female. During her trial, Thomasine Hall claimed that she was both a man and a woman, and in fact she said that she dressed as a woman uh, in women's apparel to quote get a bit for her cat and that certainly has a sexual connotation to it and then that she would sometimes dress in men's apparel and live as a man when she wanted to take on the job or the role that only men were allowed to have in colonial society. So what the court decided is that they were going to accept Thomasine's self-definition of her sex um, and they ordered that her ambiguous sex be published on the plantation where she lived and they said that Hall had to dress as a man, but also had to wear a linen cloth on her forehead as well as an apron that only women would have worn. So she would have looked a bit strange walking around in both men and women's garb. And then Thomasine was forced to pay bond for good behavior, which meant that because she was neither man nor woman, she couldn't have any kind of sexual relationship or marry anybody in the community um, because it could have been viewed as an act of sodomy um, or as an act of fornication. Based on the incomplete records from the colonial era, it's unlikely that we'll ever really understand who or what was Thomasine Hall. It's likely that she appeared female in infancy, but at puberty started to develop male genitalia as well. But that's really not what's so important about the story of Thomasine Hall. In many ways, this story represents the sort of rigidity of gender and sexual roles and definitions in the colonial era, because for the colonial people, the entire way in which they organized their society, with men at the top and women subservient, depended on fitting into these definitions of male and female, masculine and feminine, um, as well as when it comes to sexuality, heterosexual or homosexual. And so it really lends us a better understanding of colonial American society and the roles that were so rigidly enforced. Okay, so this brings us up to the last important term that we need to define, and that is sexuality.
And sexuality is a person's sexual orientation or preference, and it's their capacity for sexual feelings. That means that a person doesn't necessarily have to act out on their sexual desires as long as they know that they have a capacity for those feelings. Now, some people, just like they believe in a sex binary or a gender binary, also believe in a sexuality binary. They believe that people are either heterosexual or they're homosexual. And often people who subscribe to that theory don't believe in the concept of bisexuality or asexuality, for example. Now, there are others, and, and many more academics, believe in something called the Kinsey Scale. And the Kinsey Scale is named after a researcher named Alfred Kinsey. He was a professor of zoology at Indiana State University, and he eventually began to study human sexuality, and he gave out hundreds of thousands of surveys to Americans in the 1940s and 50s and studied their sexual behavior. And by the time he was finished, he came up with this scale of human sexual behavior. And he said that all people fit onto this scale somewhere between a zero and a six. A zero was someone who showed exclusively heterosexual behavior, and a six was someone who showed exclusively homosexual behavior. And the majority of people, according to Kinsey, did not fit on one end of the scale or the other, but they fit somewhere along this continuum, and that they showed some kind of capacity of sexual attraction for someone of the opposite sex as well as the same sex. In this table, you can see just a few of the findings of Alfred Kinsey, and if you're really interested in reading more about these reports, the Kinsey Institute has a great deal of research available online that you could read about, and it also includes research in, in modern-day sexuality uh, and in the study of um, whether or not homosexuality is something that's genetic or socially acquired. So if this is something that interests you, you might consider looking that up and reading some of the studies that have been done. Um, but in regard with regard to Kinsey's findings, I'll say that they were extremely controversial. Uh, he was Time Magazine's most influential man of the year at one point, uh, and as his research came out and became popularized, people were absolutely shocked by some of the things he found. Uh, when he came out with his first volume on male sexuality, it was far more accepted than the, the other volume on female sexuality. and. There's likely a reason for this that can be found in the gender norms of the 1950s, where it was very acceptable um, and it was understood that men were sexual beings, and yet women, outside of marriage, were supposed to close that part of themselves off. And so when Kinsey came out and he revealed that 50% of women were having sex before marriage, or that women were having bisexual experiences and men were having homosexual experiences, and that um, there were extramarital affairs by women that were almost the same number of women as men, it really shocked the public, and yet it told us for the first time that we really needed more research on the subject of sexuality because much of what we've been told about sexuality and the history of sexuality does not actually match with what people are doing in the bedroom. So you have to keep in mind that just because you see a law or a primary source that tells you that people in the colonial era, for example, were not supposed to have sex out of wedlock, that didn't necessarily mean they weren't. So part of what we're going to do in this class is to really look at what was happening behind closed doors, not what lawmakers hoped was happening or what the church hoped was happening, but what were human beings actually engaging in on a day-to-day -day basis. So now that we've defined all of the important terms, we're left with a couple of questions in order to better understand why we studied this material. And the first would, would be asking the question, why is it so important to label one another? And I'm going to spend the majority of the semester when we talk about these subjects answering that question, but you might also think about it in the context of contemporary America, why it's so important to understand if the person walking up to you is a man or a woman, or why do people feel the need to adopt a label of being heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, asexual, and, and everyone might have a different answer for this.
And then the other question which we've really alluded to throughout this is why are discussions about sex and gender relevant in a course about history? It's not something that most history teachers teach about, although they might do a unit on women's history, it's certainly lacking. And in order to really demonstrate this to you, I'm going to talk just briefly about why it was so important to the colonists right after they had begun to settle down in the New World. So the reason why it mattered so much to the colonists is that in the 17th century, gender distinctions told Anglo-Americans where a person fit into their society. Particularly before slavery existed, the biggest distinction between people was by class and by gender. And based upon some of the ideas from classical era philosophers like Aristotle, most colonists believed that women were inferior types of men. They believed that women's sexual organs were just the internal version of male genitalia. So a woman's vagina and womb were similar to a man's penis, and a woman's ovaries were like a man's testicles. They were just inside of the woman. And they understood scientifically that there was just one sex. The male sex was the correct one, and the female sex was an imperfect version of a man. And under certain circumstances, a woman could become a man if that genitalia were to fall out and form male genitalia. Now, colonial society thought that gender definition stemmed from one's biological identity, and it wasn't something they believed could be chosen by someone. Furthermore, they taught a person what their proper role was in society. There were completely different norms for someone that was male versus female. They had a gender division of labor where men would do one thing and women would do another. Men were in the public sphere and women were often in the private sphere in the home. And this was all determined based on a person's sex and thus their gender. So when the court looked at Thomasina and they judged her, they judged her on their cultural or their gendered criteria rather than just their anatomical criteria alone. With such ideas about gender in place, when the English migrants first came to the New World, they were confronted by Native Americans like the Algonquian people who had a much different gender division of labor. So the English would have a division of labor in which the men worked in the fields and the women worked in the house and reared the children. It's a very public sphere for the men versus a private sphere for the women. And yet the division of labor for most native tribes would have been that women worked in the fields and often took care of animal husbandry, while the men hunted, fished, and fowled. So when the British settlers arrived in the New World, they brought with them a very ethnocentric way of viewing the world. And ethnocentrism is looking at other people's cultures through the lens of your own and judging them, often harshly based on your own cultural ideals of what is normal. And the English believed that hunting was something that only the wealthiest, most elite members of the aristocracy would take part in. And it wasn't a job. It was something that was a diversion. It was a leisure time activity. So when they looked at the habits of the Algonquian people, they thought that the women were like slaves working so hard to support men who were lazy and idle that just went around hunting and having fun. And for their part, the native people saw the English women and thought that they were incredibly lazy, and they accused the male colonists of spoiling these creatures who could be working much harder. Gender roles were firmly established and maintained by family structures, and the nuclear family was the central economic unit of the colonial era. It was very much the basis for all of their institutions, and those include the government, the church, and their community. And these gender roles told them the kind of work that men and women were to do, and this work was certainly central to their way of life. Most importantly, though, gender roles describe the social relationship between men and women, and they answered the question, in whom should power be vested? The answer, of course, was always men. So men didn't often step outside of their traditional gender roles because there was really no need for it. They had all of the freedom that they needed in this form of society.
Women, on the other hand, who stepped outside of traditional roles were seen as especially dangerous. They represented a world turned upside down, a world in which men were unable to make sense of their position and their identity, and men were socialized from birth to believe that they should be in control of the family and their society, and this sort of collective insecurity that they would have about their social place contributed to the harsh treatment of any woman who stepped outside of her gender role. And you'll see a great example of this when we talk about the Salem witch trials in the colonial era, as well as the treatment for hysteria in the Victorian era. So, as we're at the end of this lecture, my hope is that you've really gained a better understanding of why it is that we're going to study the topics of sexuality and gender roles in American history, and also that you have a better knowledge of the definition of the difference between sex, gender, and sexuality, and that you can really explain what it is that academics believe about how gender is expressed as well as sex and sexual orientation, that you can define what the binary system is as well as some of the other ways of viewing gender, sex, and sexuality.